continuing with In Quest of Truth by Irene Coney Bear and starting the reading is, is Miguel. Please unmute and, and, and read, Miguel. So we're in Appendix 6, uh, Hereafter. This book is no place for a detailed discussion, but death does not end the life of the ego, which persists till its next incarnation. Much of the borderland troubles of psychiatry can be explained easily enough because many who have in no way prepared themselves for a continued existence after death are often unaware of their transition from the air sphere and are liable to get into difficulties owing to the fact that their consciousness cannot adapt itself to the new surroundings of the ego. It is known to very few in the medical profession that acute causes of mania can be due to the patient being quote unquote possessed by a spirit who had not realized his transition to the astral spheres. Therefore, he can become entangled in the aura of a living person. The late Dr. Carl Wigland, MD of Los Angeles, did spectacular cures by accepting this spirit thesis. Unfortunately, the majority of psychiatric medicals are too orthodox to accept the theory of the survival of personality after death. But great work has been done in Brazil in the Hospital Espirita, Porto Alegro, where spirit therapy is used in conjunction with official medical treatment. This hospital has been operating since 1926 and is famous all over Brazil. For those in England who want more information on these questions, I recommended the British Psychic College, London SW7. I was greatly in depth to the college for advice and guidance in the past. But let me now quote from the discourses by Meher Baba. Quote, under certain conditions, it is possible to use the physical senses consciously in such a way that we contact the semi-subtle spheres. That is to say, the link between the physical and the gross world and the subtle or mental plane. Thus, we can communicate with the spirits of the dead. The spirits of all human beings except those who have progressed so far as to be beyond the fourth plane, come to this semi-subtle sphere. In accordance with their samskaras, their impressions gathered during their life, they return to the semi-subtle plane for a time. These spirits are, as it were, in the waiting room of the semi-subtle sphere may be contacted by spirit communication. The semi-subtle sphere and heaven and hell and their respective experiences are not real. They are subtle enjoyments and miseries experienced through the subtle organs of the subtle body. Some of the descriptions after death are partially true but little importance should be attributed to them. During the interval between the two incarnations, the consciousness of the soul is turned towards the samskaras or impressions, with the result 
that there is a revival or a magnif magnification of corresponding experiences. The average man does not become aware of the subtle environment. He is wrapped up in his state of subjectivity and is absorbed in living through the revived samskaras. In this state, the experiences of pain and pleasure become much more intense than they were in the early life. And these subjective states of intensified joy or suffering are called respectively heaven or hell, which are illusions within the greater illusion of the phenomenal world. End of the quotes. In Meher Baba's recent book, Listen Humanity, narrated and edited by Don Stevens, published by Dad, Mead and Company, New York, 1957. There is some interesting information on this subject. Appendix seven, Kundalini Yoga, in parentheses. I am not competent to write in this subject, but we know that the ultimate aim of yoga is for the aspirant to attain union with his divine self, self uh, and divine with capital letters. Though it must always be understood that only a perfect master can bestow the seven plane consciousness that is genuine God realization. A yogi can attain to a very high level of consciousness, in fact, up to the sixth plane, and may possess tremendous powers, but he is unable to effect final union with the self, unless assisted by a God-realized master. Masters do not encourage their devotees to follow the popular forms of yoga, as they have no need for this in such exalted company. They teach that man should be in the world, but out of it at the same time, and he should attend to all the duties that he has to do. He will be assisted on his journey back to the homeland or oversoul by his master. Who will draw his unconscious? Who will draw him unconsciously along the path and across the various planes of inner existence, so that he will not be exposed to their periods? The disciple's love for his master finally burns up the ego and brings him to the ultimate union with the beloved. In this manner, through his service to humanity and his devotion for the perfect one, he achieves all that others, through the complicated practices of yoga, aspire to. The ultimate success is due to love. Some yogis, though attaining to great heights and with considerably powers, may still be without the love necessary for the final union. Meher Baba has in fact said that there are yogis constantly immersed in a state of samadhi who do not possess a spark of the divine love that is universal and, in, and unconditional and essentially for the final union. In some forms of yoga, the object of the practice is to awaken the Kundalini fire. I do not profess to know what Kundalini is beyond the fact that it is the viral force and has interconnections with Sabda Brahman. Sabda means the word or sound with capital letters. Those interested in this question can find books written on the subject. Some call Kundalini the symbolical expression of the divine soul. 
but there are so many aspects of Kundalini that it will be impossible here to elaborate or explain her, her different manifestations and functions. Oops. The Kundalini fire or the serpent symbolically coil at the base of the spine on being disturbed will begin to uncoil or raise or rise or rise through the interior of the spinal cord. The seven chakras or centers of force will become impregnated with the fire of the serpent on its journey to the top of the head where the crown chakra or thousand petal lotus resides. The headdress in the representation of some Buddhas represents this seven chakra. As also do the crowns in Christian symbology, or again the halo round the head of a saint. In some yogic exercises, not under the direct control of a yoga master, but at least under the direction of a competent disciple, the great danger is that perhaps Kundalini may turn downwards with the most unimaginably frightful consequences. The late C.W. Lidbitter gives great warning on this subject in his monograph of the chakras published by the Theosophical Publishing House. There are Western schools of yoga that teach simple breathing exercises and postures, such as standing in one's head. These are not dangerous and could be most beneficial. It is a great pity that Western system of education do not consider the importance of such methods in their gymnasiums. Uh, here's a good place to um, switch readers to uh, Marion. Could you unmute and continue? Yes, yes. <clears throat> oh, actually, this is one that Gloria was particularly interested in. So, okay. Gloria, yes, go ahead. Gloria, could you unmute and continue? I remember a couple of weeks ago. You... Okay. Appendix 8 for Aura and the Halo by Mary Baba. Uh, quote, the aura and the halo are two different things and people are unable to distinguish between the two. Few people know that an aura and a halo are quite different in respective natures, despite their close interconnection. No man can ever possess both aura and halo completely developed at one and the same time. Like the respective shadows, every man, woman, child, and baby has an aura, but only a very few individuals have a halo. And in any of the varying phases of its development, and still fewer possess a full halo. An aura is a reflection of the emotions of an individual mind, just as any physical thing possesses its shadow on the physical plane. The halo begins to appear when the aura begins to disappear. The difference between a mental reflection aura and a physical shadow is tremendous. Shadows depend upon their physical forms, but an individual aura remains unaffected, even when the person concerned drops his physical body. This is because in spite of physical death, the individual continues to possess the mind and impression in it, as well as a subtle body, which has a direct connection with the aura. Every action, significant or insignificant, intentional or in unintentional, on the part of any person creates relative impressions, samskaras, which get imprinted on the mind of the individual just as sound is preserved on a gramophone record and images of light and shade are caught on photographic plates. As thought is the first direct medium of expression of all impressions 
A deep connection is established between the thoughts and impressions of an individual. An aura, therefore, is the mental reflection of the aggregate impressions of thoughts and actions gathered by and stored in an individual mind. As long as the impressions are there, an aura is always there. As an envelope of very fine atmosphere comprising of seven colors, which remain more or less prominent according to the nature of each individual's impressions. No two men are alike in all respects, and yet all have common physical features. Similarly, the aggregate of individual impressions differ from one another, but quantitatively and qualitatively, yet every aura is comprised of seven colors common to all. These seven colors of an individual's aura represent the seven principal categories corresponding to the aggregate impressions of each. Thus, every individual aura is the image of a circle of seven colors and each aura differs from the other in proportion to the amount of each of the seven colors according to the individual's prominent impressions. For example, red would be the most prominent color in the aura of a man whose impressions are predominantly made up of lustful actions. Likewise, each aura also differs in the color formation on the borders between every two prominent colors in it. The halo begins to develop and an aura begins, begins to disappear only after an individual starts advancing on the path to world realization. When the aura begins to get more and more faint, the halo commences to shine more and more, getting brighter in proportion to the progress of the individual's consciousness on the path. The halo becomes very bright only after an individual aura is on the point of disappearing. This happens in the case of one who wakes up fully conscious in the sixth plane of complete mental illumination. In the seventh plane of reality, the God realized one is once and for all entirely free from each and every impression because the very storehouse of impressions itself, the individual mind, is then annihilated and there remains neither aura nor halo. The reality of God alone reigns supreme in self-consciousness of infinite power, infinite knowledge, and infinite bliss, with all illusion ceasing to remain as illusion. Oops. When one who is God realized is able to return with his God consciousness simultaneously to all the planes of illusion as a perfect master or Sadhguru, his halo is the most bright and infinitely brighter than all the suns of the universe put together. It is of question for anyone other than those who have attained the consciousness of the sixth plane to behold the different the divine effulgence of the master's halo. In all other cases, the halo is an expression of individual advancement on the path and a sign of the dwindling of the individual samskaras or impressions. In such cases, the halo is like a growing bright circle of the mental atmosphere of illumination, colorless through, throughout and yet in every phase of its manifestation, far, far richer in a spiritual splendor than any combinations of color can ever be. If due to love for his master, a man happens to see what appears to him as the hell of the master, it is not actually the hell, but a part of his own aura as is temporarily reflected by the effulgence of the hell of an illumined, illumined one or of a perfect master. Without necessarily being consciously advanced on the path and merely as a result of deep and sublime emotions, the aspirant may have from time to time glimpses of the reflections of inner sights, reverberations of the echoes of inner sounds, 
redolences of the inner fragrance and distant shades of the inner ecstasy. All of these are but trivialities connected with the higher illusions of the past. There are also many techniques and natural causes for the manifestations of such phenomena, which are beyond the faculties of an ordinary man. A, view, a volume could be written, especially regarding their potentialities and repercussions, both high and low. All illusory, illusory phenomena, gross, subtle, and mental, are not only dream stuff, but everything termed in the table, asterisk, note, So uh, we'll get to it, I guess. Oh, next page. Oh, is the table. Well, should we finish? Um, yes. Yeah, yes. finish yes. the text and. Yes, I'll touch, yeah. But everything termed the table as false illusion is made up of dream into dream stuff who has no value at all unless it helps man to awaken to reality. God is the only reality and all else is illusion. The whole of the gross universe is but a part of the huge cosmic illusion containing higher illusions of the spiritual planes of man's consciousness. Let's see. Um, it's not so clear, I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, well, folks, uh, that, that chart is, is, is overlapping itself. So mm -hmm. let's go on to a, yeah, um, that's strange, yes. appendix nine and, uh, um, in the individuals can go to that page uh, and see if they can make sense of it, but we won't here. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Marion, you're unmuted. Continue yes. okay. uh, reading, please. All right. Appendix nine, explanation from Meher Baba, Paren, at the express request of the author. Points communicated by means of gestures. Compassion from the material point of view. It is a fallacy to imagine that Easterners are less compassionate than Westerners, for a lack of the expression of compassion does not necessarily mean a lack of the spirit of compassion. Such questions are relative. In the East, there are not many organized relief centers, but that can be explained on economic grounds. We also have to remember that the privations and sufferings that the masses in India have to undergo naturally blunt the edge of compassion. One cannot expect a man in agony to notice the agony of others. In the majority of Eastern countries, the people rarely get one good meal every day and are mostly illiterate. So it is hardly reasonable to expect them to share the same degree of concern for animals as Westerners, who are in all respects, comparatively far better off individually and collectively. It should also be understood that the majority of stray animals wandering about are not always stray, but belong to people who live in a state of perpetual semi-starvation and in improvised shelters. So how can they afford to keep their animals better fed? The reason why unwanted animals are not put to death, as is the recognized custom in the West, is due to religious beliefs. For Hinduism teaches that the evolution of consciousness of the soul from the stone stage upwards throughout the various forms, including those of the snake, 
dog, cow, and monkey, permits of a reverence for life that the West lacks. In fact, the latter forms of animals mentioned are worshiped to this day, for they are important signposts on the evolutionary path. The general ignorance and superstition prevailing all over India undoubtedly contributes to the general apathy and apparent callousness of the people. But then again, as has been said above, it is the economic situation more than the distortion of religious values that is responsible for the great cleavage in practice between East and West on the matter of consideration for animal and humankind. But it is due to the influence of the spiritual masters and to Hindu and Buddhist doctrines that those who follow these religions cannot even dream of any organized destruction of animals, even on the grounds of compassion. For they have been taught that interference with life is equivalent to contravening or taking the law of karma into their own hands. In spite of the misery and want in India, some villages and towns try to maintain Panj Rapoles. That's in quote, which means rest homes for dumb friends, which is quite remarkable when we consider the difficulties these poor people must have to be able to afford any relief. It is a curious paradox that, though the average Westerner may be described as more humane than his Eastern brother, nevertheless, the West has been the cause of untold suffering as a result of the recent world wars in the struggle for political and economic supremacy in a manner quite contrary to the teachings of Christ. But even on that account, the Easterner would not be justified in thinking that the Westerner is by nature more inhuman than his Eastern brothers. We might say that it is all wheels within wheels. So we now turn to Meher Baba's explanation from the spiritual point of view. Compassion from the spiritual point of view. Spiritually speaking, according to the laws of evolution and karma, the more an individual suffers, the more he benefits spiritually. For this is a means of helping him to emancipate himself from the bondage of maya. Pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow, are but illusory experience like pleasant and unpleasant dreams. To be awakened from a dream, it is sometimes necessary to have some disturbing factor. For example, in order to wake up from a happy dream, an experience of unhappiness in the dream may be helpful. Similarly in life, the opposite experiences of pleasure and pain, happiness and misery, Compassion and cruelty are all essential factors in the development of consciousness, which is eventually transmuted into God consciousness. The absence of equilibrium between opposite experiences, such as compassion and cruelty, happiness and misery, is the cardinal factor that by itself sustains and promotes duality throughout the domain of illusion. Right from the first glimmer of consciousness in stone form to full consciousness in human form, the individualized soul has never once experienced a complete balancing of the opposite experiences of duality. But when the balance is arrived at, the soul recognizes its own divinity 
and the individual becomes self-realized or God conscious. It is due to the lack of balance or equilibrium that happiness is felt in our life of illusion. And this is due to its contrast with our misery. For if we experience no misery, we will be unaware of happiness. So in a sense, when experiencing misery, we are experiencing happiness at its lowest degree. If we did not have these contrasts, then there would be no progress and we would continue forever in our life of illusion. For example, if a dog always had happy and comfortable lives, he would not progress in the field of evolution through ever higher forms of life. Our progress in our evolutionary life from stone to human form needs opposite experiences, and this will ever be so. Otherwise, the divine plan of life could never be fulfilled. If there were no divine purpose, no upward path to self-realization, then the consciousness of the human soul would oscillate eternally from one opposite experience to another, and there would be no eventual conquest of Maya, which has to be transcended before man can realize his eventual union with God, who is forever eternally all merciful and compassionate. The real saints know consciously from their own personal experience that everywhere at all times, everything manifests God's infinite mercy and compassion in action under all circumstances. The question of opposite reactions of cruelty and compassion, like all other experiences in this life of illusion or maya, can best be explained or understood by a study of the essential working of the law of cause and effect. For this law is the outward expression of the underlying force of the individual samskaras, which have been born out of opposite experiences or reactions to life. Even when one feels compassion for others, or finds a lack of compassion in others, this is due to one's own samskaras expressed in accordance with the law of cause and effect. Like everything else within the domain of illusion, even the sense of right and wrong depends upon the relative samskaras of the individuals in question. There's an asterisk and it says, as the question of samskaras is such an abstract and difficult subject, and may we infer that good and evil are entirely relative, I hope the reader will study the discourses by Meher Baba, which give us an enlightening and broad understanding of the peculiarities of the complicated human mental apparatus, which even the most brilliant psychologist is unable to explain. One point is made clear, that by reason of our animal heritage, we have to accumulate more good samskaras than bad samskaras. Thus we go from good to God before the ultimate reckoning can take place. Paren, the day of judgment in Christian and Muslim parlance. Close the paren. All life is a gradual progress along the path to our ultimate salvation or liberation from the law of karma, which is the eventual triumph of God. Therefore, this is picking up on the paragraph again. Therefore, the East and the West can both be equally right and equally wrong about each other. For example, 
when a man considers himself to be right, it is due to the subconscious propulsion of his own samskaras. Though he feels the other man is wrong, he fails to understand that this feeling is due to the influence of his own samskaras. These compel him to justify himself at the expense of the other man. Rightly or wrongly, as the case may be, he will insist that the other man is mistaken. Although we cannot realize it, it is our samskaras which influence our reasoning and understanding to the extent of shaping our character and our intellectual outlook. Only a master of consciousness is able to fathom the reasons for our illogicalities and unreasonable behavior at times, whereas we remain, as always, puzzled and distressed over the contrariness of human nature, which seems to have assumed alarming proportions as we survey the world's troubles. It is by a curious irony of fate that in a country like India, where we find special temples and places of pilgrimage dedicated to animals, and where that destructive animal, the monkey, remains a pampered and protected creature, paren, which apparently under no circumstance may be destroyed, close paren. We at the same time find our distant cousins are being, for commercial prop, profit, exported in large quantities to the West for the purpose of medical research, which is being done not for gain, but for the alleviation of human suffering. This curious contradiction of human behavior, although we cannot see the reasons involved, is due to the action and reaction of the law of cause and effect, born of individual and collective samskaras. To turn back again to Mayor Baba's remarks at the beginning of this article, according to individual aptitudes and prevailing circumstances, a lack of the expression of compassion on the part of a person may not necessarily always mean a lack of the innate spirit of compassion because we do not see it. For example, suppose an experienced and skillful surgeon finds that his patient has suddenly collapsed in the midst of a major operation. He may feel that the only hope is an immediate massage of the heart necessitating a further drastic operation, causing the patient still more suffering before he attains to his recovery. Thanks, Marion. I'll take a turn now. Compassion from the point of view of divinity. From the standpoint of a master, a lack of the expression of compassion is real compassion. Though by the uninitiated, such compassion may not be understood or appreciated. For example, Sai Baba of Shirdi, who was the Kutub i Irshad, or the leading perfect master or Sadguru among the five perfect masters of his time, would often take all the money of his devotees who came to see him and to serve him. At the end of the day, he would distribute the proceeds amongst those who were not always really worthy, since they had only come to see the master in the hope of gaining some fleeting material benefit. One man who was then living at Shirdi would receive as much as a hundred rupees daily, so was able to live well and sumptuously with his large family. Whereas Gustaji Hans Hansotia, 
who was one of the master's chief devotees and who served him devotedly day and night was treated in a very different manner. He was deprived directly and indirectly of his money and even had to go without food and the amenities of daily life such as clothing and blankets. In fact, Gustaji was not treated with the slightest consideration. But there is always a purpose from the standpoint of divinity and Gustaji benefited greatly. Though not in the way the ordinary outsider might have expected. This devotee was eventually directed by Sai Baba to Upasni Maharaj, one of the perfect masters mentioned above. Then later, Maharaj handed over Ustaji to Mer Baba with the command never to leave the avatar. Gustaji, at Baba's orders, observed silence for 30 years. Thus, this man had the inestimable privilege of serving three perfect masters. When he died in October 1957, Baba said, he has realized me. When we sometimes hear of the strange doings of the masters or saints, we must always remember that they are, quote unquote, above the law and cannot be judged by ordinary human standards. For whatever they may or may not do, they are working for the ultimate good of not only the individual, but for the spiritual benefit of the world at large. So we, we must never presume to judge or criticize for these great spiritual beings have the spiritual viewpoint of God, which is always inaccessible to our limited minds. Although we can recognize the fact that a code of ethics provides us with the necessary standards of conduct and behavior and acts as a line of demarcation between the opposites, such as good and bad, right and wrong. At the same time, we should appreciate that from the spiritual aspect, ethics are but stepping stones towards the eventual unfoldment of our spiritual consciousness. For ultimately, we have to transcend the limitations of our mind with its constant play of opposites and the duality of our transitory and illusory world. Only when we have reached the divine state of liberation or enlightenment can we recognize the truth that has hitherto been hidden from us? For it is our ignorance of the infinite self within and without that constitutes Maya or the cosmic illusion. Only when our false ego has been transformed into God consciousness can we know the wisdom and glory of the masters and that all life is one in the realm of truth? Appendix 10, musts. The subject of the musts is exceedingly difficult and complex. Dr. Donkin, an English medical man, 
has been the first to write a book about that. And his work is a classic for all those interested in human psychology. The aspirants to God range in varying degree from the sadhu in his saffron robe to the great muktas and majzubs of the seventh plane. The most unusual of all these pilgrims on the path are the musts. The Westerner who is interested in the real or secret India has heard vaguely of these peculiar beings, the God man, the God intoxicated. God gives out his love to mankind in diverse ways. His expression needs the purest channels. And what purer channels are there than the great musts? For they, in losing their egos in their love for God, have transcended the limitations of the flesh. During his ascent towards God consciousness, a man, a must has, in his contemplation of eternal being, become oblivious of the phenomenal world of forms, which for him has become but the domain of Maya. The spirit having risen so high becomes free from its bondage of the flesh and designs not to descend again to the valley of shadows, the physical plane. In such an instance, the body of the aspirant takes on the appearance of a madman or a peculiar person. These musts, therefore, may be described as human dynamo of what can only be called God essence. Here I will digress for a moment to ask, what is God essence? The dictionary definition of spirit tells us that spirit is life or intelligence conceived of as entirely apart from physical embodiment. It is vital essence, force, energy, as distinct from matter. There is no doubt that the must who has attained to the higher spheres of consciousness has entered a, a region that is the domain of energy. Matter becomes a solidification of energy. It follows that Sorry, I read that wrong. Matter being a solidification of energy, it follows that when a man has transcended the physical form of energy and entered into the realm of spiritual energy, he enters a state in which his consciousness consists of vibrating spiritual energy. His entire life becomes a powerful organ for the production of spiritual energy. I presume that the reason why Meribaba is so occupied with his work with the musts, about which incidentally I know nothing, is because he is making use of this force for his universal work on humanity and that he is canalizing, canalizing this energy into one great channel for the upliftment of mankind in the coming awakening of the heart in the new dispensation. But we must bear in mind that Mer Baba tells us nothing except that his work with the musts is a matter between him and them. So we cannot really conjecture. 
Um, Miguel, could you take another turn? I think the chapter ending is coming up. We'll see. The mass are entirely absorbed in and concentrated on God. Thus, they become perfect channels through which the master can work. These beings are closely linked with the spiritual life of humanity. Many a city in India has a mass who acts as quote unquote spiritual churchman for that particular area. The spiritual churchman of Pune is Joshi Buhua, a six plain mast, and therefore of considerably considerable importance in the spiritual world. I have visited him. He was sitting almost naked in a corner of one of Pune's marketplaces. I was impressed with his fine uh, sike and dignified bearing. He greeted my companion, one of Baba's close men, graciously and accepted our homage. We offered him cake and coffee which he ate and drank with the manner of a cultured man. He had been a well-known lawyer before he became a god addict. He always sat at the same spot, surrounded with rags. The mass offered my friend one to sit on, but happily I was able to accommodate myself on a door doorstep. I sense the spiritual radiance that enveloped him. I could see from his expression that he was in a state of concentrated preoccupation with the holy grade of his desire and had attained a bliss that I could not, uh, he had attained a bliss that I could not even aspire to. Since I saw him, he has been removed to an asylum where he can be better looked after. Once when on a visit to an army friend in Delhi, Kant, I met the local mast. One evening I had walked into the colonel's room and was surprised to see a strange figure wrapped in a blanket squatting in a corner. He took no notice of me and was absorbed in contemplation. I suggested that we should show him a photo of Meher Baba. In doing so, the mass gave a jump as if he had sustained an electric shock. He clasped the picture to his breast and refused to part with it. We could not get it back. Later, the mass went to sleep in the garden and the colonel managed to take it away while substituting another of Baba. The next morning, the mass seemed puzzled, but went away happily with the other photo in his possession. This mass seldom spoke, but occasionally prophesied great disasters coming upon the world. Some of these mass are well known in the localities in which they live. They also have circles of devotees. At Delhi, there used to be a very famous mass, Hafizji Navina. This man was the spiritual charge man of Delhi. About him, let me quote verbatim from the supplement, from the supplement to the book already mentioned. Quote, he was quite blind and quite naked, but despite his blindness, he will walk over the old city of Delhi. There is a strange story in connection with his nakedness. 
it seems that certain influential residents of Delhi told the police that the man walking about the streets quite naked was indecent. So the police brought him to the police station. There he was told that he will be taken to the court and charged. And he demanded to be taken in a palakin. Seeing he was blind and already held in some respect by many people, this request was, was agreed to. But when the palakin reached the magistrate's court and its curtains were open, all they found was a stone lying on the floor of the palakin. The police returned to the station, their ears smarting with the reprimands of their superiors, and so out Hafizji again from the streets of Delhi. This time they begged him to come with them to the court, since they themselves were getting into trouble because of him. So he came and appeared in court and was duly convicted and locked in a prison cell. The same night, however, some policemen found Hafizji again free in the town. And knowing he had that day been locked up, locked up, reported the matter to the police station. Investigation show the Hafizji cell was quite empty though the locks on the gates of the cell were intact, closed, and apparently unattempted with. So from that day forth, the fame of Hafizji became greatly spread throughout the city, and he was allowed to move freely as and where he liked. Hafizji passed away on the 6th July, 1941, and his fame was so great that reports of his death were published even in the times of India, Bombay. And that brings us to the end. Very good. Okay. Oh. Wow. 